and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Emma Scott from SIPS and today we'll be exploring the impact of coronavirus on supply chains. I'm joined today by Malcolm Harrison, Group CEO of SIPS and Dr John Glenn, SIPS economist and visiting fellow at Cranfield University. Thank you for joining us today. These are really unprecedented times for procurement with supply chain disruption on a global scale. What steps are you seeing that procurement teams are taking to weather the storm and get through this crisis? Yeah, Emma, you're absolutely right. These really are unprecedented times. And if I think of the conversations that I've had over the last three or four weeks with various leaders in procurement and supply across the world, I, the most amazing thing is how quickly this, uh, how quickly this thing is changing. Um, and the impact varies hugely by sector. So I mean, if you're in healthcare, it's a very different story to if you're in the airline industry or if you're in food retail or if you're in, or you're, if you're in distribution. Um, everybody's been affected by very different changes in demand. And it's not all about um, massive collapses in demand. Some people are experiencing huge surges in demand as well. And everybody's already coping with the supply shortages from China. If you remember, coronavirus hit China months ago. So everybody's already coping with those issues. And then you've got these massive channel shifts as well. So it, it, it's an incredibly dynamic and changing situation. Now, what am I seeing people doing in terms of how they're reacting to that? Well, I guess very, very short term. It's all about cash. It's all about making sure that you've got the cash that you need. Um, it's all about making sure that you've got the supply availability that you need. Um, and sometimes it's been about turning supply off because you simply had ordered a whole load of things that you no longer require because your demand has gone to zero. Um, and then let's not forget the amount of effort that's gone into getting people to work remotely, to work from home. Um, for some people, that's been, I guess, a relatively easy for change. For others, it's been a massive change. If you've got call centers and you've had to somehow find a way of putting those, getting those call centers uh, able to set up to run from home, that's been a huge change. Short term, you know, not very short term, but short term, I think a lot of it's been about understanding your supply base and understanding how resilient your suppliers are, making sure they've got the right finance in place, uh, understanding their health. Uh, there's been some renegotiation going on, inevitably. Um, and then, of course, there's been a lot going on to meet the new demand scenarios. So has it been about um, channel shifts? Uh, has it been about having to deal with logistics issues, freight issues? And only once you get through all of that, do people start looking at the medium and long term issues. Um, and here is where it gets even more unpredictable because an awful lot of it is based upon demand. And what is going to happen to demand? And what is going to happen to the way that people are going to behave? How are people going to live? How are they going to eat? How are they going to shop? What are their leisure activities going to be? And what does all of that then mean for the supply chains, which have been set up to operate very efficiently to um, supply that traditional demand? And we now know that traditional demand is going to be different, but we don't know how it's going to be different. We don't know yeah. what the new normal is going to be. And then lots of discussions around e-commerce. So e-commerce is playing a big role at the moment. Is, is that going to carry on? Are we going to see that continued acceleration? And then people are talking about the new context. So what a new work pattern is going to be. Um, so there's an incredible amount going on. And I think it's important to understand just how unpredictable the, the context is at the moment. Thank you for that. Thank you. John, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, the, what have been the biggest impacts or pinch points for procurement professionals? And what are those questions that they should be asking their business, their customers and their suppliers? Well, it's quite interesting, really, isn't it? Because as Malcolm said, this issue of cash is a kind of double edged sword, because on one hand, you have to protect cash, both as businesses and households will be doing the same. John Maynard Keynes, the Cambridge economist, said that when we go into a downturn, there's a danger we get what's called a paradox of thrift that people increase their savings at a point when we actually need them to spend for the economy uh, to recover. But that's a perfectly acceptable and predictable human behavior. Uh, what we now need to look at is the fact that if people aren't spending, then that's gonna cause the economy to dip more. But to counterbalance that, we have people who are, if they're in the fortunate position that their, their incomes are being maintained, be it by furloughing or their businesses are still uh, intact and paying them, uh, then there's a lot of pent up consumption power. And to Malcolm's point, what is that going to look like when we start to come out of this initial stage uh, of our response to the pandemic? Will people go back and start consuming in a way which will cause quite a rapid recovery? Uh, how many of our businesses will be sustained? What will unemployment look like? So we're in a position now where there is a vast amount of uncertainty in terms of the aggregate level of demand in the economy, uh, but also the pattern of demand 
uh, when we uh, recover from that. And again, to Malcolm's point, how will people behave? As we react to the second stage of the pandemic, we'll still have to keep an amount of social distancing uh, in order to make sure that we don't get a second peak. So what will that mean for things like click and collect? What will it mean to Malcolm's point for people working at home uh, and the way in which businesses are configured? What will that mean for how our businesses look as we go forward? The, the vast amount of real estate that we have at the moment, will we need to maintain it? Will we be looking for more flexible workspaces? And then also we need to look at our supply chains. Will our supply chains be coming onshore? I know talking to Malcolm the other day, he'd seen examples of organizations talking about insourcing. So taking back activities that they'd outsourced the market and bringing them in in order to maintain uh, the security of the supply chain. And then at a very macro level, what sort of modes of, of, of transportation will we use? Will we transfer from air to sea, from sea to rail? And that would include bringing supplies in from China. So we know the Silk Road has been developed and will a lot of stuff uh, go on to rail rather than going by sea? And what will be the mode of transport? These are all questions uh, that procurement professionals are going to face in the very near future. And Emma, if I can say, I think John really raises the key, key question there for procurement professionals, which is all about what are the future sourcing options going to be? And, and if you look at the last 10, 15 years, an awful lot of focus has gone into uh, just in time and low cost. Um, and now people are saying on one hand, well, yes, that's still important because we know everyone's going to be strapped for cash and we know we've got to be competitive in the marketplace. On the other hand, people are saying, what price would you put on resilience? You know, so how important is you build a resilient supply chain? And if a resilient supply chain costs you a little bit more because you have to go for a local source of supply, or you need to put a little bit more stock into your supply chain, which you, you took out because you were so focused on ensuring that it was low cost as possible. Well, can you afford to do that? Or can you not afford to do that? Yeah. And, and then how are we going to ensure that the sustainability agenda, you know, the environmental protection agenda, is, is continues to get the focus that it has been getting so rightly in recent years? I think those are some of the, the biggest dilemmas and biggest questions for, for professionals uh, uh, in, in procurement and supply. And I think to that point, Malcolm, as well, it, it, it's also transparency of your supply chain. So I know we've been doing a lot of work with the risk methods guys uh, looking at you know how technology can help us to actually map our supply chain and identify those nodes where there's potential breakdowns and react to them much quicker so the whole use of machine learning ai to map out our supply chain is going to be an increasing part of our future and again to your point are these costs that we cannot afford uh, to incur you know that we have to have that transparency going forward yeah, John, I think you, you, the point of it is interesting you talk about transparency and you talk about data. If I go back to some of the conversations I've been having, I would say that those are probably two of the, the biggest concerns that people have at the moment in terms of um, not just my first tier suppliers, but what about my, my supplier yeah. suppliers, the second tier, third tier? And how can we be sure about the financial stability of, of not just you know, our prime supplier, but maybe a critical supplier further down the supply chain? And then you're so right about data. Everybody's talking about the challenges of, of replanning, um, of, of reforecasting. And, and then if you haven't got accurate data or if you haven't got the systems to support you to be able to readily access the data that you have, that makes those processes even more difficult. So you, you're absolutely right. People are saying, maybe I've got to accelerate those systems projects. Maybe absolutely. I I've got to accelerate the, the, the digital projects that I was kind of, kind of going to do anyway. Mm. Um, and I think those companies that maybe had invested are now saying, well, thank goodness we did invest when we did. Quite. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, John, what, uh, what about the impact on economies across the world? What, um, in, in a nutshell, that's quite a big question, obviously. But um, what kind of things have you been seeing? Well, the, the key issue there is that, you know, we are a global economy. And, and I think I made a point in the a video that I did for SIPS the other day that we will either, we will either come out of this uh, downturn together as a global economy, we will win as a global economy, or we will lose as a global economy. But what does that actually mean? That means that there is an amount of um, responsibility on richer economies to provide uh, fiscal stimulus for the smaller economies, to provide loans for them, 
to provide uh, access to liquidity from the IMF, from the World Bank, that allows them to work their way through this crisis uh, and get them to a point where they recover quickly. One of the key issues that we will have, uh, and it's an issue for procurement professionals, is that there will be what, what economists would call an asynchronous recovery. We will not all recover at the same time. Some economies, China will have come through it, South Korea will have come through it faster than us, but they need us to recover in order that we mm. can start demanding the goods that they need. So we need to make sure that the global economy recovers together as a unit and we start providing you know, funding from Northern Europe to help Southern European economies, funding from America and Europe to help Southeast Asia, to help South America, and, and perhaps most importantly, to help Africa, so that we get to a point where we recover quickly. And then in terms of the length of the downturn, um, I was reading Robert Schiller, the Nobel laureate the other day, and he said, you know, the behavioral response and the panic that we see is perfectly predictable. We've got a situation where there's a lots, of, lots of unemployment, but the, the key thing is that we should recover quickly, particularly if we get a vaccine uh, quickly, within about 12 to 18 months. So yes, there will be a downturn. Yes, we'll have to manage it in the way that Malcolm has just talked about. But we don't see a depression uh, similar to that that we saw uh, in the 1930s. So if we're talking about the shape of the recovery, it's highly unlikely that it will be V-shaped unless we get a vaccine, let's say, in September. More likely that it will be U-shaped. So we'll go down, we'll bump along the bottom for maybe six to 12 months, and then we'll recover. But we're not going to get the L-shaped depression that we had in the 1930s. Great, thank you. And Malcolm, you and I have been talking to lots of procurement teams over the last few weeks and it seems that they're busier than ever. You know, how important are professional procurement um, skills at a time like this? Well, they're critically important, Emma. But I mean, I would say that they're always critically important and, and at a time like this, when every business is facing issues with their supply chain, um, then it's procurement and supply professionals and the people that have got the right skills to be able to resolve those challenges. Um, and, and, you know, I think what people need to really think about is not just the skills, but how they apply them. Um, so, you know, we've seen some really good examples of people, I think, taking very sensible, mature decisions about how you manage cash flow. Uh, so it's not just a one size fits all. Oh, I'm desperate for cash then I need to make sure I pay everybody as slowly as I possibly can. I think you've seen some really good examples of some of the UK retailers, um, Morrison, Sainsbury, that's a Waitrose as well today, saying we're actually going to pay specific suppliers more quickly. Uh, because you know, they are so critical to us. And it's great to see those, what I would call strategic supply chain decisions being taken, um, not just pure financial decisions. So yeah, incredibly important. Um, the different sourcing models are absolutely gonna come into play as well. Um, and that's where you need the people with the right skills and the right understanding to be able to come up with the right solutions for a specific uh, supply scenario. And we've seen, um so much on um, social media with procurement professionals reaching out to each other for help and reaching out to the wider network. Um, so I think more than ever, um, having your professional body behind you and, and that network is really important. And what help is out there for procurement professionals from SITS? Well, so look, I mean, SITS is very much open for business. We may be all operating remotely, but we are absolutely open for business. And what, what we're trying to do is switch as many of our events as possible online. And we're trying to repurpose them a bit and try and make them more relevant to you know, the COVID-19 scenario that, 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 that everybody is facing. Uh, we're trying to develop uh, more podcasts, webinars. We're trying to set up virtual classrooms so that we can, we can train people virtually. Because we must never, never forget about the people of tomorrow and the fact that we're going to need the people with the right skills. Um, and SIP has got a critical role to play in terms of doing that. We've also got a really important role to play in terms of creating that network and allowing people to collaborate uh, because you know, different people have got different challenges at the moment. Um, and I think there's more of a preparedness to share and to work together than I've possibly seen for many years. And I do think that's something that, that we as SIPs can do. And in addition to that, don't forget all of those really good SIPs knowledge tips that we have. So you know, it's really obvious things like make sure you prioritize your high risk um, supply sources first. Um, and thinking about how it differs by geography, how it differs by channel. Make sure you do that really good analysis of your supply chain beyond tier one, as we were saying earlier on. Um, thinking about inventory, you know, inventory is, is critical in a time like this. And you need to make sure you've not got the wrong inventory either. I mean, we've heard stories of, 
of people really quite concerned about having not just not enough infantry, but actually having the wrong infantry because you've got a, a channel shift uh, that, that you've been hit by. Um, I think everybody would always say be very careful about relying upon forecast data, particularly at the moment. Um, and, and nobody can underestimate the importance of communication. I've heard some great stories of companies really reaching out to their suppliers and keeping communicating with them, keeping in contact with them, building those relationships. And you absolutely have to do the same within your organizations as well. Excellent, thanks for that. And I guess my final question to both of you, you know, if you had that crystal ball, um, and I guess procurement teams are already working on getting through the crisis now, but um, putting plans in place in, in case anything like this happens before. But what, what will co post COVID-19 look like? What impact will our new way of working have on supply chains? Will they ever actually look the same again? Well, if I, if I start there, what I would say is uh, one thing that will happen, and we've seen it happening already, is that organisations will have to work at greater pace. They'll have to exhibit greater agility. Um, if you want to look at it after this podcast, there's a fantastic TED talk by a, a woman called Linda Hill, looking at innovation and how we innovate quickly. And she talks about creative abrasion. We have to allow people in the room to, to start to strategize, but to Malcolm's point, what is demand going to look like and how are we going to adjust our business quickly uh, in order to be able to, to, to respond to that? We then have to build agile businesses that respond swiftly. I, f I found a wonderful phrase the other day, which, you know, it's all about experimentation, getting ideas and minimum viable products out to the market and procurement being at the core of delivering that capability. But what we can't get into is what's called pilot in purgatory where we we move so slowly that we don't respond to what it is that the market needs uh, at, a, at a pace and we need to be able to do that and then we need to have what they call creative resolution get those new ideas out there let the, let the rubber hit the road and then learn from what we see and then lastly what I'd ask you to do is to make sure that you get people in the room who actually know what it is that your customer wants and very often they are at the bottom of your organizational pyramid. They're not the, the highest paid person in the organization. They're the person who interacts with your business, uh, with your customers on a day-to-day -day basis. Get them into the development and innovation process. Talk to them. They know your customers best. They have the closer contact with what's going on and make sure that you respond swiftly to what it is that your customer wants. And by the way, I, I, I love this phrase from Mike Ryan at the WHO. He says, don't allow perfection to be the enemy of action. So we, we have to get out there and experiment with what it is that our customer wants and be incredibly responsive to them. Thanks, John. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me sort of build a little bit, a little bit on that. Um, I do agree with John that things like resilience and agility are, are going to be fundamentally important. And I don't think that we're going to go back to how we were before. Um, I really don't. Now, you know, quite how it's going to change, nobody really knows. But, but for sure, it's going to change. And I think the most important for procurement and supply professionals is that you're, you're engaged, that you're engaged in, in the right decisions, but also you're asking the right questions. So you're asking those questions about how to understand what the demand is going to be. You're asking the questions about what the different sourcing options might be. You're asking those questions about how do you get that right data? Um, how do you make sure you've got the people with the right skills? And, and for sure, the agenda, the challenges for people working in procurement and supply, it was exciting and complex enough anyway. It's just got a, it's just got a whole lot more complex. So I don't think anything has gone off the agenda. So to me, all of those challenges around transparency, around sustainability, around how you embrace new technology, new ways of working, they're still all there. Mm. And then in addition, you've now got that focus at home to be far more resilient and far more agile than you were being asked to do before. Uh, it's a really exciting time. Uh, there's a huge amount for this profession to do. Um, and we're just there to help support the profession and build the capability to help meet those challenges. Excellent. Thank you both for that. That draws to the end of the podcast for today. So thank you very much, Malcolm, and for John. Um, in the description uh, below, we'll put the link through to our Knowledge Hub, uh, where you can get all our latest COVID news and also sign up to Supply Management Daily. Uh, but from everybody here, thank you very much. <laughs>